We, um, we spent some time last week, a lot of time, going through the first four of these seven feasts of Moses. And if you're new with us, we've been going through the book of Numbers, and don't worry, some people say, I don't like the book of Numbers, I was never good in math in high school and all that stuff. It's not, <laughs> nothing like that, and I realize that a lot of people are afraid of the book of Numbers because they think it's all about numbers, and it really isn't. Um, but it's the history of Israel out in the, in the wilderness, and God has spoken to his people numerous times, in, you know, twice in Exodus and twice in Leviticus, and these two chapters and numbers and then again he's going to do it in Deuteronomy but he's spoken to his people and he's told them about keeping the Sabbath and keeping the new moon festivals and keeping uh, these daily sacrifices and we went over by review a lot of that last week and and he speaks all those times I mentioned in in those books he speaks about these feasts these seven particular feasts that he wants his keep people to keep and, and the problem for us sometimes, I, I know it is for me, I'm, I'm assuming it is for others, but we will read this history and we'll say, okay, well, that's interesting, but how does that apply to me? And it, it does, we just don't realize it sometimes. Um, every single one of us in here longs for hope, the promise of hope. As much as we may believe theologically, that we have peace with God, we want peace, the peace of God in our lives. More and more we want that. And we want power to live the way that he wants us to live. We know it's right to live the way he's called us to, but we don't know how sometimes. It's because we don't access his power, his spirit, who enables us to do that. And so as we look at these feasts, there's a lot in here for us that applies to that. Now, Without reviewing everything that we did last week, just very quickly, there are seven annual feasts that God has established for his people, Israel, and they, they serve two purposes. The first purpose is that they commemorate. They, they look back on something that God has done, and then they also anticipate something that God is going to do. These first four, the ones that we looked at last week, the, that, the four that happened in the spring uh, of the year, in the first, religious, the first month of the religious year, um, these, these first four, all we can see now, we're anticipating the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in the Passover, the burial of Jesus Christ in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the Feast of First Fruits, and then the coming of the, ch of the Holy Spirit upon the church at um, the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost. And I'm not going to go over all that. If you're interested, you can get us a CD or you can go online and listen to that. But today we're going to look at these three feasts that are in the fall, and they're really very important because these have not been fulfilled. These other four commemorated God's deliverance of the people out of Egypt and then um, the giving of the law at Sinai. Those four feasts all commemorated that. But the, but the Jewish nation didn't realize that they were anticipating the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the church. They didn't understand that. We can look back and we can see that. So now here we are in the middle between those four feasts that have been fulfilled and these three feasts that have not yet. And we know they must anticipate, but we don't know everything exactly. People have lots of opinions about that, but, but we don't know everything exactly. So let's sort of walk through some of these feasts. It's important, and I realize that a lot of this, I won't read all of the verses because it's, it's a repetition. Um, if you've read it already, you know. It's a repetition of a lot of the different um, sacrifices they were to make. It says in chapter 29 in verse 1, And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, which, by the way, is this coming Thursday, um, it, it starts Wednesday night. Remember, the Jewish day starts in the evening. So um, on, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. We looked at that last week. That's a what? That's a Sabbath, right, or Shabbat. That's a, no work. So it's not a Saturday. It, it, wherever it falls in the week, it doesn't matter. It's going to be a Shabbat or Sabbath. Um, for for to you, it's a day of blowing the trumpets. It's the Feast of Trumpets, it's called in other places. Uh, today, you know, it's known as uh, Rosh Hashanah, which just means the head of the year, but Happy New Year. But that's not what God's calling it here. But it's the, it's the beginning of a new year, a civil year in Israel. Uh, so people call it 
um, head of the year, or they say Happy New Year. By the way, if you have Jewish friends and you want to wish them a Happy New Year, I'm going to teach you how to say Happy New Year. It's really very simple. So Rosh Hashanah is, you, maybe you don't know, but Shana is year. So you already know. See how much Hebrew you already know? Do you know how to say hello in Hebrew? Shalom. Well, that was two, three people probably knew that. Yeah, Shalom, right? You know, you know a lot of Hebrew. You know a lot more than you realize that you know. Okay. Um, so, Shana is year. Can you say it? Shana. 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 Very good. Tova. Tova, like T O V A. Tova. Shana Tova. Now say it like you're saying Happy New Year. Shana Tova. <laughs> now you're all kosher. Okay. So, so, on Thursday, to all your Jewish friends, you can say Shana Tova. And they'll say, where'd you learn that? At church. Go, church teaches you that stuff? <laughs> All right, so these feasts are important. And, 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 and again, as important as they are, and there are many people around, and especially a lot of you know, Messianic Jews and the, you know, people, you know, Jewish people who've come to know Christ their Savior will believe, and a lot of Gentiles who are believers and then they get interested in this, We'll start to think we have to celebrate these feasts. Well, we don't actually have to celebrate these feasts. Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, that don't let anybody judge you about a Sabbath day, a new moon festival. That's all the stuff we're talking about in here. Or, or a feast day. These were all a shadow of what was to come, but the reality is found in Jesus Christ. So if you're in Jesus Christ, you're already in the reality. Okay, you're already in the reality if you're in Jesus Christ. So don't be tied down by that kind of stuff. He says here, uh, you'll have, it, for, to you it's a day of blowing the trumpet. So it's, a, it's, it's the, the day of the Feast of Trumpets. And he says, and you'll offer a burnt offering. It's a sweet aroma to the Lord. One young bull, one ram, seven lambs in their first year without blemish. And then he goes on these various grain offerings and wine and, and all. And then verse 6, besides the burnt offering with its grain offering for the new moon and the regular burnt offering. In other words, all these things that you normally do on that day, you can continue to do it. But on this particular day, on the, on the Feast of Trumpets, these, this is a special offering you're to make. And I realize that for most of us in this room, that's kind of lost on us, like why this many animals and this much grain? And for our purposes this morning, that doesn't matter as much. I want us to see that God has laid out a template. He calls these, in Hebrew it's the moedim, the, the appointed times. God has appointed certain times in the year that he wants his people, Israel, to recognize that they would live in this pattern, and they would, that they would see it so that when things start to come to fruition, they get it, that's the idea. Just the same way we teach pattern or we teach words or we teach prayers or things like that to our children, God is doing with his children, with Israel. And so he calls them his appointed times. And, and he's really saying, I want you to keep the appointments that I'm making with you, which actually would be an instructive thing for us to do once in a while, to realize that there are certain things that God really does care about and really does want us to do. He wants to meet with us. We looked at that last week. He wants to meet with us every day. He wants to spend time with us. He wants to, us to get to know him better. He says, this is, the, this is the Feast of Trumpets. Now, this begins a 10-day period. All these, these three feasts, just very quickly, let me look forward, and then we'll come right back to the Feast of Trumpets. There are three feasts that are going to happen. On the first day of the month is the Feast of Trumpets. On the 10th day of the month, is the Feast of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And then on the 15th day of the month, going out for another eight days, really, from there, is the Feast of Tabernacles, or booths, or um, you might know it as. Okay, so between this day, you know, the one we're looking at, the Feast of Trumpets, and the Feast of Yom Kippur, is in Hebrew tradition, it's known as uh, the Days of Awe, A-W-E, Awe. You know, we use the word awesome. Oh, it's awesome. This, this cheesesteak is awesome. No, it's not. God is awesome. Okay. And, and awe is rooted in the word fear. We don't realize that. And if you said this cheesesteak is fearsome, okay, that, that you probably wouldn't want to eat it, you know, okay. Uh, it's probably old or grown hair or something like that. So, no, the days of awe, the days of fear, because on Yom Kippur, he's going to say, this is a solemn day. This is a day when you're to take account of who you are before the Lord and offer up certain sacrifices. And in Hebrew tradition, these, these 10 days, the days of awe, are the days when people look at themselves. They inspect themselves. 
And they actually do something that, you know, it, we, we have a way sometimes, not us, I mean, maybe some other services or other churches, but not us here, but we have this way sometimes of being a little arrogant as Christians. Now, look, we got the new covenant. We're in the new covenant. If you're in Jesus Christ, you're in. If you accepted the Lord as your Savior, you're in. But we can be a little arrogant sometimes and think, you know, well, yeah, we, we don't know all that. We don't need all this other stuff. But it would be good to learn from other people. Like, for example, what God has done with his people, Israel, is he's taught them to take advantage of these 10 days that they would look carefully at their own lives and then look at their relationships with other people and go to others and say, look, if there's some way that I have hurt you or that I've offended you this year, let's talk about that because I want to ask your forgiveness. I want to be right before the Lord in terms of this relationship, and I want to be right between us. You know, we tend to say, hey, I'm forgiven. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry I hurt you. And then we move on. It's like, but it, there's a little bit more to that, and that's part of what he teaches his people. So there's the, the Feast of Trumpets, and, it, and it, people go through all kinds of uh, questions about, you know, well, what kind of trumpets were used? And for the most part, probably the shofar, you know, the ram's horn was blown. But what does it prophesy? Well, we don't know. Cause the, people act very confident of themselves. I realize, and you can read a lot of different people who will very confidently tell you uh, that we know the rapture is going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets. Well, we don't know that the rapture is going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets. I sure hope the rapture happens on the Feast of Trumpets, because that's Wednesday night. We're out of here. <laughs> okay? I didn't set a date. Don't tell anybody I did, because I don't know that that's true. I'm just saying, I hope that happens. But we don't know that. We don't know that it's actually going to happen at, at, at any time, the Feast of Trumpets. But it is, there are a lot of things that become interesting in that. One thing for sure, there is a trumpet involved. That's part of the reason why people get interested in it. Some people will say, well, we know it has to happen on the Feast of Trumpets because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that, that this is going to happen at the last trump. And so that's going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets. Maybe. Maybe not. We don't know that for sure. People act very confident of this. The interesting thing, when, when the same writer, Paul, talks about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the trump of God. Oh, there you go with the trump of God and the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ will rise first. Except that the trump of God is not a shofar. The trump of God, there's only two times in the whole scripture you ever hear that expression. The trump of God is used there, speaking of the rapture, and it's also used in Exodus 19 when the Lord spoke from Sinai, the trump of God. And I got a feeling that was a whole lot louder than any shofar or any bugle, or any other horn that you can imagine, that's the trump of it. He's got his own way of doing it. So it's going to be a shout, just be ready. But maybe it is then, because a lot of people believe that this time period opens up the, the time of the tribulation. Uh, there's a lot of good explanation for why that could be. I don't know that it is. Uh, I've studied it, and I sure hope it is. But I don't know that. But, you have, but, but what I know is from tradition, for what that's worth. It starts this 10-day period among, among observant Jewish people leading up to Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. Now, if you look down at verse 17, he says, on the 10th day of this seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall afflict your souls, and you shall not do any, any work or any regular work. Again, it's a Sabbath. And, and he goes on and he talks about the different offerings. Now, he doesn't get into something here. The Lord doesn't get into something here, which he does mention in another place, and that's in Leviticus. You don't need to turn there, but you can uh, read it for yourself in Leviticus 16. This is the Day of Atonement that happens. It's a very interesting day because, you know, we've spent a lot of time between our study in Leviticus and our study in Numbers going over the the responsibilities of the priests and what they would do and all that. For 364 days a year, the priests would offer up the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice, the, you know, the, um, the, 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 the incense offering, all these different things. They would go about their regular work every single day, except for one day, this day, Yom Kippur. In fact, 
on every single day of the year, nobody was ever allowed. We've talked a lot about the tabernacle and then later on the temple. Nobody was allowed into the Holy of the Holies except for one day, and that's Yom Kippur. On that day, the priest was allowed to go in there. In fact, we're told in Leviticus chapter 16 that on that day, there'd be a, a number of sacrifices, and one of those sacrifices would be a bull for his own sins he would offer up. And, and then after he'd done that, there, there would be two goats, and they would, they would actually do a lottery thing. They'd like put two stones in a bag or something like that, and they put it before the Lord, they pray about it, and one stone would represent one goat, and the other stone would represent another goat, and then the high priest would reach in and determine which goat was going to be sacrificed and which goat was going to be called the scapegoat. Now, some of us have heard some of this before, and maybe it's new to others, or at least we've all heard the term scapegoat before, and now you know where it comes from, okay? So these, these two goats now... Would, would be presented, and, and God, by lottery, has chosen which goat would be sacrificed. That goat was called the, for the Lord, and, and that goat would be offered up, and its blood would be sprinkled on the mercy seat, or on the Ark of the Covenant, in the Holy of Holies. The high priest was actually allowed to go in there, and he would sprinkle this blood on the mercy seat um, in the Holy of Holies for the sins of the nation. But on the other goat, now, he would lay his hands on that goat, symbolically transferring all the sins of Israel, because he's the high priest, right? So he can symbolically transfer all the sins of Israel onto that goat. And then a special man would take, or appointed man would take that goat out into the wilderness and, and, and send it off, and that goat would die. And this, the idea, actually, it's portrayed very well for us, Psalm 103, that as far as the east is from the west, that's how far God has put our sins from himself. It's a really cool picture. You know, we, we like that picture in a lot of ways. Our problem is we, we bring that goat back. And, and by the way, that happened a few times. There were times. Can you imagine the horror? I mean, it, you know, we, we, yeah, I know, we can laugh at it, right? But imagine the horror. God has said, this is what you shall do. You are, to, you know, you are to, to transfer all the sins of the nation onto this goat, and then a pointed man takes it out, and that goat will die, and that is for, forever. That goat will be gone. And then one day you hear, meh, meh, you know, and here comes this, this goat walking into camp. Like, what happened? But we do that. Don't we do that? Sometimes, you know, we say, praise the Lord, I'm forgiven for this sin. And then he say, and we'll say later on, I mean, I know the Lord forgive me, but, and then we bring it up and we start churning it through again. We bring, you know, the devil gets our goat in that case. So that's what's happening. And, well, what do you do? What do you do in a situation where um, you don't have a temple? I mean, the temple's been destroyed since 70 AD. What do you do when you don't have a temple? What do you, uh, what do you sacrifice in order to, to take care of the sins? If you don't, if, if, if you don't have the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world who's taken the price of your sins, then what do you do? And, and uh, uh, you don't have to believe me. Check it out for yourself. But, you know, in many cases on Yom Kippur and the Orthodox will take like a chicken, a dead chicken, and, and the, the rabbi will, you know, wave it over his head. I, for the life of me, I still haven't figured out exactly what that works. But I just know that the Lord has not said, you know, take for thyself a chicken and wave it over thine head. He hasn't said that. What do you do about your sin? Uh, David makes it really clear, and I think, you know, we, we overlook this sometimes, the, this, the, the responsibility that we also have in this. I mean, there's, there's no one who can pay the price for our sins except Jesus Christ himself. We can't. And yet God tells his people, I want you to make these offerings. David, after his sin with Bathsheba, he writes in Psalm 51, he says, you do not desire sacrifice, or I would give it. You don't delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God. That you will not despise. That's what God wants from us. God wants us to have a broken heart, not, not to be hurt. He's not talking about he wants us to walk around morbid. The point is that, that our heart not be so strong that we stand there. A lot, of, a lot of very strong Christians standing around, very sure of ourselves. He wants us to realize that our dependence 
is upon him. That, that the promise that we look for is only found in him, that the peace that we long for is only found in him, and the power for living is only found in him. You know, that, that goat problem is a real problem. In fact, by the time they get to, to Jerusalem, you know, when, when the, the nation is in Canaan and, and Jerusalem has become the capital, um, now it's easier to take that goat out into the wilderness because they can go, if you've been to, to Jerusalem, you know what the east is. So the east is down toward the Dead Sea. So they could take the goat out that direction and then throw it off a cliff and be sure that that goat is dead. Believe me, after that goat came back to the camp a few times, you want to make sure that goat is gone, right? And then one man would, you know, stand on a mountain and signal to another man who signal to another man who signal to another man all the way back up to Jerusalem to the high priest who's now standing looking toward the east. The goat is dead. In fact, and this is just, this is free, but you won't find this in the Bible, and a lot of times, you know, we we can smile a little bit at the things that we'll find in like the Talmud and these, these uh, Talmud's a commentary, you know, that the rabbis had. And, and we smile at some of the things that they write sometimes or we shake our heads and we say, well, that's too bad that they see it that way. But there is a, a portion, look it up for yourself. It's, um, in fact, you could find it, I was gonna say, on the internet, it's, you know it's true, but no, it is true. Uh, there, there, the Talmud's divided up into different books, but Yoma is the name of the book, 39b, Yoma 39b, look it up. Um, it says that after a while, what they would do in, the, in the hundred, a couple hundred years leading up to about the time of Christ, a practice developed among, among the priests where they would not only tie a red cord around the horns of the scapegoat, because you don't want to confuse them. If God said that's the scapegoat, you don't want to sacrifice that goat and send the other one out. So they would tie a cord. You know, it's easy to forget which goat is which sometimes. So tie a cord around it. Okay, that's fine. A red cord. And, the, and of the same cord, they would tie it to the door of the temple. And when the man would take the, the goat out into the wilderness, when he pushed that goat off the cliff, now you're going to smile at this. You're going to think, oh, that's cute. Who believes that? They say that, um, the, the Talmud says that the, the cord that was tied to the temple door actually turned white. This crimson cord turned white. And most of you are saying, you believe in magic. You know, that's, that's a fairy tale. Yeah, I know, it's, it's far-fetched. But here's what's really interesting. The rabbis couldn't figure out what happened. Because in the last 38 to 40 years before the destruction of the temple, when was the temple destroyed? Who remembers? 70 AD, good, good, all right. 70 AD, now work backward 38 years. What do you get to? 32, I know math is difficult this hour in the morning, okay? That's kind of a coincidence. It said, they say in there, in, in the Talmud, that the cord stopped turning white. And they couldn't figure out why. I know why because the one who paid the price for sin, the scapegoat, the one who took my sin, had already been sacrificed. And there was no need for that anymore. Now, you know, we can smile and say that's far-fetched, except the fact that they would, 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 would speculate and ask why suggests this must really have been happening. They weren't making it up. They, they couldn't figure it out. And then the temple was destroyed because they'd rejected the one who took away sin. We're all looking for peace. There's only one peace, the peace with God that each one of us needs is only found in Jesus Christ. He's the one who paid the price for our sins. And we look for the peace of God in our lives, but you can't have the peace of God. You can't have, no one can experience that peace that sense of real well-being, until first we have peace with God. Some of you in here are way too young. Well, there's enough of you who are not. Jimi Hendrix, Cry a Love Tour, 1970. Yeah, some of you are going, oh, I remember. Cry a Love Tour. 
Hendrix died um, in September 18, 1970. It was on September 6th of 1970 on that tour. He died in England, in London. But, he, but on the 6th, he was in Denmark doing a concert. And that night, he did kind of a typical Hendrix thing. He smashed his guitar, and the audience goes wild and all that. And then he fell to his knees, and no one, there, there came to a point where it was awkward, and there was a sense that something was wrong. And he said from the stage, if any of you knows how to find real peace, because this is the whole anti-war movement. This is the time everybody's looking for peace, you know, anti-institutions, all that. And, and he says, if any of you know how to find real peace, meet with me backstage. I don't know if anybody did. But 12 days later, he died of an overdose. You know, so many people are looking for peace, and so many people will pass up the opportunity to have peace with God because we think we can satisfy that peace of God without calling it that. We think we can find well-being. We think we can find security. We think we can find it through enough money or, or in relationship or whatever it may happen to be, but it's only found in Jesus Christ. All right, let's quickly move on. He says, um, he says, on the 15th, on verse 12, on the 15th day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. You shall keep it as a feast for, to the Lord for seven days. And he goes on, I'll save you a lot of work. He goes on to verse 39, and he describes every single day the sacrifices they are to make. And every single day, it's made up of bulls and goats and rams and grain and wine and all these various things. The only difference, actually, between each day is the number of bulls that are offered. And, you know, some of you already, I realize, because some, sometimes we, we read this stuff and go, wow, okay, what's that all about? Well, it, it starts with 13 bulls, and it goes to 12 bulls, and 11 bulls, and 10 bulls, and 9 bulls. It goes all the way down. If you count up the total number of bulls, you get to 70. I know that's really very exciting. So just hold on to that for a bit. He says this is, this is going to be the feast of tabernacles. And again, we have a lot of information given to us in, in Leviticus 23. This will be a feast for a whole week, the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and, and even today, you can find it among Orthodox Jews who live in like Northeast Philly or in Brooklyn or in Skokie, Illinois or places like that where you have people who want to be observant and, and, and who are Orthodox. You certainly find it. Uh, there have been a couple times I've had a chance to be in Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles or right at the end of it. And you see, you know, houses that, where they've done exactly what the Lord says. He tells them, not here, but he tells them in Leviticus, I want you to build a little booth or a tabernacle where your family will stay for this whole week. Every single night, I want you to eat there, and I want you to sleep there. And, the, and it's very specific. God says, I want you to build it out of branches, and the branches of trees it, it can't be any bigger than about you know, two inches wide, and you're supposed to leave gaps between all these, these branches so that when you look up at, uh, at the roof at night, you look right through it, and you'll see the stars. So that your children will ask, Dad, what are we doing out here? right? Which your kids would ask, what are we doing out here? And you say, we're doing this to remind us how God took us through the wilderness and, and always provided for us. There are a number of other things that happened during that time. It's called the Feast of Ingathering, which has to do with the harvest. And there's a time to pray for rain because the rainy season will start after that. But, and there's a number of other things. I won't get into all of that. But they, they stay in these temporary dwellings for this week, and then there's an extra day after that, but they stay in these temporary dwellings until they go to their permanent dwellings. Temporary dwellings, and they leave them later on to go to their permanent dwelling. Many people believe this might have to do with the time when Israel will stay in, you know, in, in Petra as a temporary dwelling to, to find security um, during during the tribulation period before they end up in their permanent dwelling in the kingdom. That could be. There are a lot of things that I don't want to speculate too far on this. But one thing I know is that there's a real emphasis in this on two things. One is on water, and the other, by extension, is on the Spirit of God. There's, there's a passage that almost all of us in here know. It's in John chapter 7. You don't have to turn there, but in John chapter 7, 
verses 37 through 39. We're very familiar with it. It says that on the last and the greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he said something. Well, that happens on the last and the greatest day of this feast, because this is a seven-day feast, we're told, and then there's an additional day that's tagged on the end, the eighth day. It's called the last and the greatest day. And on that day, everybody assembles at the, at the temple area, um, or would have in those days, as many people as, as possible. And it was, a, it was called one of the mandatory feasts. Passover was a mandatory feast. The Feast of Weeks was a mandatory feast, so you had these two that were mandatory in the spring, and this one, the Feast of Tabernacles, was mandatory in the fall. And, I mean, I've seen pictures of the, the Temple Mount today. It's about 20 acres big. And I've, I've seen 80,000 Muslims praying on it. And there was still room left. So how many people can you fit there? 100,000? I don't know. You know, you got there's buildings and stuff, but still, how many people can you fit? Well, one of the things that, that they would do, by the time you get to the time of Jesus, the priests were doing certain things during each one of these seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles. And we're told that uh, on that day, um, excuse me, let me find it, um, that on each one of these days, the feast would make a procession from, from the Temple Mount area, and they would walk down to the Pool of Siloam, decent hike, but it's at least all downhill, and then they would bring pitchers with them, and they would fill up these pitchers with water. They would walk back up to the Temple Mount, and then they would stand there in the Temple Court area, and they would pour out this water. All these people are all around. Everybody's praying, and they would, they would pour out this water. It's a picture of the kingdom to come, and they would read from Isaiah chapter 12, where he would say, the Lord would say, therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And in that day, meaning in the kingdom, right? They're, that, and they're, 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 someone's reading this while they're pouring out this water from these, from these pictures. And in that day you will say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his deeds among the peoples, make mention that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry and shout, O inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. Every single day, they would read that while they were pouring water out. On the last day, on the last and the greatest day, the eighth day, they did something entirely different. Well, it, was, it looked like that. But it was the greatest day. You, the place was thronged with people. That's the day that Jesus was on the Temple Mount. That's what J the Apostle John tells us. And it's on that day what the priests would do is they'd still make the walk down to the Pool of Siloam, and they'd still take the pictures, and they would, they would make like they were putting water in, but they didn't. And everybody knew it. And they'd walk back up to the, the Temple Mount, and they would read from another portion of Isaiah, from Isaiah 44, while they were acting like they were pouring out this water, but there was no water. It was dry. And they would read this. Yet hear now, O Jacob, my servant Israel, whom I have chosen, thus saith the Lord who made you, fear not, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground, and I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. And they will spring up among the grass like willows by the water courses. Thus says the Lord King of Israel, and thus says his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me. Now picture that, this august assembly, all these people there, they're all prostrate on the ground, and they're praying, and, they're, and someone is shouting out this scripture as they're reading it, and there's silence. And John says it was at that point that Jesus stood up while everybody else is praying. He stood up and he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And out of his very bosom will flow torrents of living water. And John says, he's really honest. He said, we didn't know what he was talking about. But after he was resurrected, then we understood he was speaking of the Holy Spirit. That's a connection. That's not John's opinion. That's a fact. So the water that's being referred to here in Isaiah, 
the imaginary water that doesn't exist at that point is all pointing forward to a need, right? And a promise that one would come and fulfill it. Jesus stands and says, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. If you're thirsty, you come to me and drink. And the reality is, here's the problem. There are so many of us in this room right now who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And we're thirsty. And we think, well, he's, this is an offer of salvation. And it absolutely is, because you can't be born again without being born of the Spirit. That's what born again means, born of the Spirit. The Spirit does a work as you place your faith in Jesus Christ. But each of us experiences thirst. We experience thirst in our lives. We experience thirst in our jobs. We experience thirst in our business. We experience thirst in, in wrong habits, things that we do, and our sins, or the stuff we've done, and we just grind on, and we grind on, and we try to work it all out and fix it, and we come up with our little slogans, and if we get enough bumper stickers on our car, or, or whatever it is, somehow that tells us we're okay, but there's nothing okay until we come back to him full face and say, okay, Lord, I am dry. I am dry. And I need you to pour your spirit out upon me. And he says he will never withhold his spirit from anyone who asks. He will never withhold his spirit from, from a child of God who asks for his spirit. And he will never withhold his grace from anyone who says, I am broken, I, I confess my sins, I believe that Jesus died for me, I want to be saved. That's where we begin. And once we're saved, he will never withhold his spirit and the fullness of the spirit and that sense of, okay, I'm okay again. I'm gone from being dry and thirsty to being quenched and wet. <laughs> He'll never withhold that. And that's normal. The normal Christian life is to walk by the power of the spirit. That's what God desires for us. That's what God wants for us. That's what he wants for you. We've all got things that hold us back. We've all got our own pride. We've all got our own stuff. You fill in the blank for what stuff you have. I got my stuff. You got your stuff. But we need our, our thirst quenched. We need him to, to let us know that there's nothing to fear, that he's in this. We need him, only his assurance. All the other people can pat us on the back, say it's going to be fine. They don't know, but he does. And he's the one who's going to take us through it. And he's the one in whom there is healing. And he's the one in whom there is hope. And he's the one in, in whom there is solution to whatever the problem may happen to be. It's only found in Jesus Christ. And we can speculate, and believe me, if we had time, we could go on a big speculation on what these three feasts mean. What I think is important is that he's given us these three feasts, and in one sense particularly, this Feast of Tabernacles, because this is the one that will be celebrated throughout the Millennial Kingdom. This is the one that all the nations of the world will be required also to celebrate, and if they don't, they won't have any, interesting, they won't have any water for a year. They won't have any rain for a year. And how many nations are there in the world today? Don't ask the United Nations. Go to Genesis chapter 20 and count them, count them up. 70 nations. 70 bulls, 70 nations. I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. But the only one who paid the price for the sins of all the nations, the only one who can solve the problems of all the nations, and the only one who can solve my problems and yours is Jesus Christ. And for each believer in here who is dry and who is thirsty, he says, you come to me. I will not withhold from you. I will give you of my spirit freely. Let's stand together.